Welcome to Authors Night uh, with the East Hampton Library. Uh, this event is generously sponsored by CIB Private Wealth Management, the Hilaria and Alec Baldwin Foundation, Patty Kenner, Barbara and Stephen Heyman, Michelle Tortorelli and Tom Kearns, and Janet C. Ross. We are pleased to present Alan Steinfeld being interviewed by Bill Boggs. At the end of this interview, uh, there'll be a Q&A. Please type your questions in the chat window and uh, the questions will be addressed uh, toward the end of the uh, interview. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn over the interview tonight to Bill Boggs. Uh, Dino, thank you very much. My, my all-time favorite employee of the brilliant East Hampton Library. It's great to be working with you. You're a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, look, the logo is right there. Um, Alan Steinfeld is one of the world's leading authorities on, I would say, unexplained phenomena, UFOs. His book is Making Contact, Preparing for the New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence. Mm -hmm. And um, I've spent a good part of yesterday afternoon, a good part of this afternoon, going through the, the book. I've got notes and things. And what I think, our, my, as an interviewer here, my objective is, I hope that in the next 45 minutes, Alan, mm -hmm. we can convince many people that, that the extraordinary is real. Okay. Right. So th th what do you want your book to accomplish? Thank you. That's a great question. It's an honor to be interviewed by you wait, and your... I haven't done it yet, Alan. Well, just <laughs> wait. <laughs> well, at least back. your history is hold, important. Hold it back. Okay, I, okay, I will. Go Thank on. you. I want people to know that this is a reality. This is not something people just have imagined and made up and think it's a good story. There is something going on in our skies. We don't know what it is but it's out there and the government is now slowly coming forward to tell us it's real. What do we do with that information is up to all of us. How do we explore the unknown? It is not something to be afraid of. These beings are not here to take over our world. They're here to awaken us to the greater possibility of who we are as human beings. Right, right. That, look, look yeah. for years, yes. for years, we have heard that the government has aliens mm -hmm. stored away. Right. Um, I've often said that I've never interviewed a sitting president or a former president. One of the first questions I would ask would be, look, President Clinton or Obama or Trump, like the first couple of days in office, did someone come in and say to you, look, here's a story. We've got all this stuff in Roswell. We can't talk about it. Don't ever tell anybody. Or all these years have we this is just is it folklore no it's it not folklore ufoetic it's, folklore it's changing and it's changing i'm going to show you a little clip here that will show you how much is changing this is from 60 minutes about two months ago and this is headlines on 60 minutes because what happened in june is that there was a release by the senate intelligence committee about the reality of UFOs. So this is what 60 Minutes said about it. We have tackled many strange stories on 60 Minutes, but perhaps none like this. It's the story of the US government's grudging acknowledgement of unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, more commonly known as UFOs. After decades of public denial, the Pentagon now admits there's something out there and the U.S. Senate wants to know what it is. The Intelligence Committee has ordered the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense to deliver a report on the mysterious sightings by next month. Okay. The story will continue in a moment. So what you're telling me is that UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are real. Bill, I think we're beyond that already. The government has already stated for the record that they're real. I'm not telling you that. The United States government is telling you that. That guy is an intelligence officer who looked into what is now being called UAPs. Not then why did they change it to That's UAPs? A, I'll tell you. It was UFOs, that was UAPs. It's going to take generations to get rid of them. I know. Things. But the reason they told you this, because the government is giving us hints about what... Hints? 
Hints. The government gives hints. This is a hint. <laughs> it went from unidentified flying object to unexplained aerial phenomena. So okay. basically, the only words that really changed was object to phenomena. Phenomenal. And they're discovering this is not just things in the sky. There's other incidences that are happening on there's telepathy there's healing there's um a kind of synchronicity people are having altered states they're having these time space distortions so this is and not just 12, 12 o'clock at night after five right. hours of drinking but, but, well anyway, go ahead those aren't the only people who see this I know. no I know. but there is something that is a phenomenal effect on human beings that is more than just objects and the government Really, I think they've held this back because they don't know how to explain this. Well, if the government ha has this information, yes. and, if, and it would appear that they, and other governments do as well, mm -hmm. what is the commonality of the thinking? If England has it, and if uh, Thailand has it, and the United States, and maybe Canada has information, why would these governments be in uh, coercion with, each, with cahoots with each other not to let the public know what why well i'll tell you there's what the main reason they give they don't want the public to to for, to go into mass hysteria i don't think that'll happen i don't either uh the other reason is there's some technology there that the military wants that they don't want to share yeah, that's a very good point and yeah. the other reason i think is primary is that the corporations the multinational corporations that live off the petrol dollar you know the fossil fuels yeah don't want this technology out there. If these things are really appearing in our skies and there's been over 100,000 reported cases in the last 10 years, Ooh. then, and that's unreal, it's probably 100 times more than the reported cases. I've seen UFOs I never reported. So these corporations don't want us to know that technology because they're not filling up their gas tank to get here. Imagine what that will do when we have that sort of energy. That's yeah, yeah, that another, another headline for the military industrial <laughs> complex. I, I, I got a couple of questions. Anything here, you want, because you're asking good questions. No, you're well, right. I, Why? What's the big deal that there's aliens here, right? Right. It upsets everything we know about reality. That's the fourth uh, reason. This, th this yeah. can, comes from the book. Yeah. Right. These crafts, and, and I want to talk about encounters. We'll yes. talk about crafts for a couple of minutes and encounters, right? These crafts are not here to invade our planet, like War of the Worlds, a right. great, that was a fine movie. The original one was really good. They're here to gently coax us into awakening. Let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. you, you maintain. Yes. These crafts are not here to invade our planet. They're here to gently coax us into awakening. Now, how can you arrive at that conclusion? What, well, what's your deduction? Now? My deduction is, and other people, this book is actually a, a collection of 11 different of the best authors in the yeah. field that I research. It's so the not just you writing, it's the top people in the world. Exactly. Yeah. The conclusion is, let's say these things have just been here since 1947, <clears throat> which is where Roswell was. Okay. Why haven't they taken over? Why haven't they invaded? So they're not here. There's been no incident where there's been um, a, a plane or something that has um, mishap because they've seen they've seen these things. The only incident is that people don't know what to do with it. So they don't seem to be invading. They don't seem to be upsetting people. They're here to show us that they're present, but not to take over. There's a gentle awakening that has to happen to humanity. If they just show up <laughs> on the classic White House lawn, people wouldn't know what to do with it. But if they come and go and move in, people slowly acclimate to the idea that there's something else here. And we are in that very moment of, of awakening to the fact, because when the government says, look, Bill, they've already said they're here, right? This is what the guy said just now. It changes our perspective on what we think the world is. Do you think, and this may yeah. sound like a comedic question, no? Summit, but with, do you think that with Q, QAnon yeah. and all the crazy theories like you're getting vaccinated and right. a chip is going inside you, <laughs> that you, you now can make a better, more logical case for UFOs because of, there's so much and, more crazy and Everything is so ridiculous. No, I think, you know, we have to get used to the fact that we're not alone in the universe. Why is that such a hard concept? You yeah. quoted Arthur C. Clarke the yeah. other day. You said either the universe is full. Either way. Either way. Either we're it's light. Or we're the only, either we're the only life 
in this universe or the universe is full of life. Either way, that's phenomenal. One of the things I picked up this yeah. afternoon, I thought this was fascinating. One of the one of the people, one of the writers in the book, makes a hypothesis yeah. that our human DNA is so complex that in a in a way he's saying that the, that the the universe seeded us mm -hmm. as human beings. That's the panspermia the, uh, yeah. theory. What an interesting theory well, that the, is. Gary Nolan from the University of Las Vegas says that DNA is older than the Earth itself. So maybe that is the extraterrestrial. Maybe because it's too complex just to be here for the last five and a half billion years that the Earth, Earth existed. The DNA is- The too, DNA is- that, that really and, woke me up when I read and so, I, I, And believe me, I was already awake. I was reading, <laughs> but it really woke me up. So Brother. maybe we are the extraterrestrials. Could that be? Because we're, uh, this is another level of that. I've known a few. Okay, okay. Right. but there's something here that might not be organic to earth. I think human consciousness itself is different than all the other animals. We oh, yeah, may be, and the book goes into this, we may be modified genetically from the evolving primates that have been slowly moving here on the earth and something may have been injected into our DNA to make us different. <laughs> Look how different we are. We build houses, we have restaurants, we have, you know, and we're here from the beautiful Babettes in East Hampton, I have to say. so. Yeah. And, um, but we do things animals don't do. We are strange for earth creatures. So that's another hypothesis. I'm just throwing out a lot of hypotheses. Well, what I like, see, yeah. honestly, what I, I've always tried to personally be an open-minded person. I don't approach something I, I can't mm -hmm. possibly be. And my, my hypothesis here is to convi try to convince people that the extraordinary actually could be real. Edgar Mitchell, that Apollo, what was the Apollo 11, 14, 14, 14 yeah. uh, astronaut, about the whole subject we're talking about now, this is a US astronaut, mm -hmm. said, okay, enough is enough. What did he mean? First, I want to tell you, he grew up in Roswell, New Mexico, Edgar Mitchell. People don't know that. No, I, I could. And when he came back from the moon, a lot of the locals said, you know, there was a craft that landed here and there was these bodies that were recovered. Yeah. And if, if you want to know about this, go to the FBI vault. There's a memo called the Guy Huddle Memo. From Where is the vault? The vault online, the oh, FBI I vault. I thought you had they, to like open No, no, there's a vault, oh, which is the FBI website. Excellent. And you look up UFOs, there's maybe not hundreds, but there's most looked at documents talk about these ships that crashed in New Mexico. Right. So Edgar Mitchell said, yeah, let's open up the truth. Why, if the government knows something, why are they hiding us? From I, us? I don't, you know, I, that's the thing that has always fascinated me. I'll, that's the one thing that would make me doubt is, okay, but why? Because is anybody here, would anybody here like go run screaming in the night if you, I, if, if actually was I think, some no, further okay, proof? No. Well, maybe he would, right. but some further proof. No <laughs> one further proof the, that there were UFOs. The idea is the other factor besides yeah. the multinational corporations that we have to understand reality in a small box. Re every, we're told reality is this big. And when someone tells you it's not that, that suddenly exactly then, right. then what we think is true is different. What we believe our world shifts. It's, it's a paradigm clash so what we thought was reality is not reality and that changes everything okay. for us so. i think it might be we have a, a woman here actually happens to be my yes my beloved uh, girlfriend significant yes. of her jane rothschild who lived out there in new mexico and i want her to slide in. i want her to no, talk you, no i'll get out oh okay i'll, I'll go for a walk well, I, she talks you know I, I'll, I'll I, be back. I think it's important to talk to people who've had experiences yeah, and, so and that's why thank right? you. It's, it's not just like i want my girlfriend to, uh, to, it's to okay buy. if you do bill <laughs> it's okay so jane <laughs> join us because i think experiences <laughs> have an answer yeah, for this and would you tell us your experience because yeah i will okay please because i always th you know thought i poo pooed ufos mm -hmm. until it, i saw one what um, happened i was living in new mexico from 1985 to 1997 mm -hmm. and one evening probably in probably in the mid 90s i was driving up to taos oh, i'll look at you yeah tell me i will look at you that's okay okay i was driving up to taos and just as i was approaching the town which is a small town, quite honestly. Um, 
and there's no cars, dark as could be, no, no lights. Out of, in the distance was a bright, bright green light that caught my eye and came toward my, the windshield, toward me so fast, I mean, faster than one could, you know, than possible, came right up to the from, windshield. From what angle? From, from, from 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. 60 degrees. And what time of day was it? Night. It was okay. night. It was dark. Okay. It zoomed right toward me. I was in such shock and it disappeared. It took mm. off. It went straight up and it was gone. And I happened to be approaching a restaurant that was on a hill, right. which is like right before you come into Taos. I drove up the, the, the driveway of the uh, restaurant and I went in trembling. And, and the hostess said, can I help you? I said, I am in shock. I just saw a UFO. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, that happens here all the time. <laughs> and I was like, you have to be kidding. She said, no, no, you know, it happens. We're so used to people coming in and telling us that. So I sat down, I calmed myself and I continued on because I was spending the weekend in Taos. But did that change your life at all? That sighting? Because I think, point. I think it good does point. change people when they have a sighting. Did it change you? You know, I, I think living in New Mexico changed me. Mm -hmm. And that was part of it. It just opened me up to a belief of, of this more than being a New York City girl. <laughs> um, it, 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 just the, the possibility that it exists. I now believe it. And then I have another experience. Please, tell share. Me, yes, share the other experience. Um, a few years later, I was uh, going to see a show on Broadway. And I happened to be sitting next to a man. And you, know, you chat when you're in waiting for the show to start. Where are you from? Da, 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 da. He was from Roswell. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's so amazing. I lived in New Mexico for 12 years. Um, and I asked him about, what did he think about the, uh, the news about a spaceship crashing and that there were bodies. Yeah. And he said to me, it's absolutely true. He was the editor of the Roswell newspaper. And he said, I know for a fact, they took the bodies out. They put them somewhere, but he said, it's a hundred percent happened. Mm -hmm. That changed me. Thank you. Because it is a reality. They brought those bodies to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, actually, from New Mexico. And there's a big cover up. They said first in the Roswell paper, they said, Oh yeah, something landed, flying saucer crashes outside of Roswell. And the next day they said, No, 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 it wasn't a flying, it was a weather balloon. And they're sticking to the weather balloon story. And the Air Force has been in a ridicule campaign since the 40s really? to say anyone who's seen a UFO must be crazy. And this has been a-, a That has changed because look at- It's changed well, now it was, because, yes. It was April, 2020. Yes. When two of our best jets were shot off a carrier right. to investigate something and explain what happened. This was like a year and a half ago. That was a year and a half ago, but that goes back to the Nimitz the Nimitz was um, the Nimitz was an aircraft carrier outside of San Diego, and they saw this thing in the sky. And these jet pilots, Fravor, Doctor David Fra or not the pilot Fravor, followed this thing, locked it in a radar, and it was in the shape of a tic tac. They they call it a tic tac because it, it was white and it had no propulsion, and it would zoom up eighty thousand miles and then down to the surface of the water, and then it was gone. Right. So <clears throat> that started to freak people out. They don't know what to do with it. They started to report it. And that was actually repressed for a long time, the, 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 the footage from the Nemets. And then they have footage the last, I don't know, 50 years. That guy, Elizondo, says there's footage that would blow you away. But right now, they're not ready to release it because are we ready to change our ideas of reality? Well, that's, again, this I'm, is really what the book is about. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Jane. That was so good because it's the experiencers that really count here because the more people come forward and share their experiences, the more we can understand there's a real reality to this. Okay, just to remind you all, yeah. we're talking to the Alan Seinfeld, the author of Making contact, preparing for the new realities of extraterrestrial existence. Right. Let's get into some specific yeah. stories that you don't consider too outlandish. There okay. are truly outlandish. There are. Stories, there are. But specific stories of contact, because it, the contacts mm -hmm. written about by the many writers in the book are not just looking at like gray shaped people mm -hmm. with large heads, mm -hmm. although 
some of them some are. are. Yeah. Uh, others are just a life force or a feeling. Tell us about the variety of okay. the variety of contacts that just a few. I, I'll tell you the one that story, that's, some stories. The one that kicks it off is 1961, the story of Betty and Barney Hill. And they're driving from Montreal to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And they see a light in the sky. They stop, they pull over. Barney takes out his binoculars. He said, it looks weird. They get back in their car and they go down the road and four hours of time are missing. They arrive in Portsmouth. Four hours of time are four missing. Hour, they arrive at home in Portsmouth and it's four hours later than it should have been. They don't know what happened. There's no idea, but they start to have nightmares and and weird traumatic experiences. Finally, they go to a hypnotherapist who would just hypnotize people who had combat fatigue, trauma from war, right. this guy, Benjamin Simon, this is 1961. And Simon says, these people are more traumatized than anyone who's seen hard combat. So what went on? They were just in a car. Finally, he hypnotized them and he saw them being taken aboard by these creatures with the big eyes and examined. So this is what they were saying under hypnosis. Under hypnosis. Under hypnosis right. And they, they were able to relive the trauma and have some completion because they saw what happened during that time. Betty had a ripped dress. Barney had his shoes scuffed. But they had these nightmares that kept them, like, you know, traumatized until they could work it out. So that was actually, there's a plaque in New Hampshire on the side of the road outside of Lincoln, New Hampshire, saying this is where Betty and Barney Hill were abducted on September 19th, 1961. Wow, abducted. Abducted. And they were an interracial couple. They didn't want news. They wanted to stay out of the news. And they they made headlines. And um, that's one case. The, well, give us, well, I have yeah. a couple more questions yeah. about that. But give us another what you consider is a credible story. When the, I say credible, okay. what I mean by that is some sense that there's some verification that the per person is I'll, whacked out one I'll, night. I'll tell you one of my favorites. Go ahead. Snowflake, New Han so Snowflake uh, Arizona, there's a loggers there and they see a light in the forest and they stop and this one guy, Travis Walton, I'm sure you've heard of him, yeah. runs out of the truck towards this light and he is blasted and knocked, maybe dead, unconscious. The crew, you know, goes away because they think this light is after them next. But they say, we can't leave Travis there. They go back to look for him and he's not there. So they don't know what to do. And the, and the craft isn't there, that light is not there. And so they go to the sheriff's office. The sheriff thinks they probably killed this guy and just made this UFO story up. Whoa. But anyway, they send out search parties Hundreds of people searching through the woods for Travis Walton. They can't find him. He appears five days later on the side of the road. And he, he tells the story of how he was and taken. the story was that not only was he shot out, he, it was an, he thinks it was an accident. This beam killed him and the beings on board revived him. It took five days. And then he only remembers a half hour of this. There's a movie called Fire in the Sky which is taken from this whole story. And, but the, the fact that makes it um, verifiable is that they couldn't find him for five days after this thing. Wow. And, and, you know, there's all this drama about these people being accused of having killed him. He shows up the side of the road by a telephone booth and says, I'm back. And he, um, you know, they pick him up and say, what happens? And he only remembers a half hour of being on board the ship. You can look at the book, Fire in the Sky by Travis Walton. That is one of the most documented cases. And there's a documentary about that. So that's another one, but this happens a lot. Well, oh, why, yeah. Um, yeah. in terms of the reporting, why are there so many different descriptions of alien beings? Well, the obvious- Large heads, great bodies. That's like the, the alarms. That's a familiar one, but there are other descriptions. And then there are some, with no body. And it's right, just some are just energy. Well, yeah. one reason is that <clears throat> maybe is that there's more than one race visiting us, right? Sure. So if there's more than one race, they're not just little grays. They might be etherically, might be blue beings. This is, and for me, my experience, if you want to know, they actually appeared in a dream like state. And I, 
I woke up with a mark on the back of my leg. So I thought it was a dream. It appeared like a dream, these beings coming to me. And then I woke up the next day, I was camping out. And I woke up the next day with a four pronged puncture mark. And me and my girlfriend said, it felt like we were suspended in time. So mm. that was kind of weird. And I write about this in the book, but there's many types of beings visiting us and there's many levels of consciousness here. So some of them are after our DNA and there's a whole reason people think they're after our DNA, especially for the little grays. And this might be a little too out there. These little grays, some people say, have reached the end of their evolution. They became all mental. They, they, they lost their passion, their creative drive, their, their empathy, and all the things that make us human, our emotion. And they wanted to genetically take some of our DNA to make a hybrid race. See, I think now, somehow, Th that's a little, getting it, yeah, getting that's it. a little too much well, for let, our audience. Let's, let's talk about yeah. how people have been affected by okay. in, encounters. And fascinated again to read in the book, making making contact here about the, the theory that they're able to plug into our consciousness yeah. and the people's consciousness and knowledge is changed. Like one woman, after an encounter, was able to display talent and knowledge that she had absolutely previously had no idea that she had within her. Right. So some people do talk about telepathy yeah. being increased because they're getting these telepathic downloads. And there, there was a bunch of artists they call the Allagash Four. They went for a camping trip up in northern Maine. Yeah. They had this experience. And do you know about those guys? No. They came back and their artistic talent became much more developed, much more complex. So people are affected. As, in, as if they're evolving in awareness, involving a deeper sense of themselves. This is, this is what um, a lot of people have. It's an upgrade to our human facility. We're somehow able to be more compassionate, be more creative, more loving, more expansive. This seems to be the side effect of many encounters. Does that make sense? Yeah. So well, that, that's how people's lives- Another, another yeah, sort of each, official question. Yeah. This, this kind of complicated philosophy here, you're maintaining through the book and through what people are saying in the book, life is not an accident of creation, as our current worldview implies. Rather, it's an emergent property of creation itself. Let me repeat that. Right. Life is not an accident of creation, as is our current worldview. Rather, it's an emergent property of creation itself. Right. So the, we've been brought up with the idea that, you know, there was a little spark that created life in these little yeah. mud puddles and, and there was this simple DNA and it slowly became complex humans. But what <clears throat> if DNA life is, is an innate factor of creation? What if we're not an accident? What if life is abundant throughout the universe? It's not dependent on some chance mutation. Darwin says we evolve through a chance mutation. I'm saying life is the essence of creation itself. It's why creation exists without getting religious. But there's something about life, what we are as li living beings that emerges from the ethers, if that, does that make sense? It's, it's difficult. I think it's, yeah. it's difficult to comprehend, to, to comprehend that. I think there are some things that for almost all brains are, mm -hmm. are Im impossible to truly comprehend. For example, and maybe it would have served, you know, better to talk about this at the beginning. Right. It's impossible to fully understand how large the universe is. Mm -hmm. You can hear miles and light years and everything like that. But if you really, you know, next time it's a beautiful dark night, if your neighborhood is not overlit, right? Go out, look at the sky and try to imagine an end to it because there is no end to it. There is, no, and, right. And but maybe we're as infinite as creation itself. Maybe there's a part of us that is connected to these stars. There's a great quote I, I put in this book by, um, by Relka. He says, a billion stars go spinning through the night, blazing high above your head. 
but in you is the presence that will be when all the stars are dead. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a non-local essence to our human beingness. Maybe we transcend the body. This is what a lot of near-death studies, out-of-body studies, remote viewing, which I, I teach. That's, that's a phenomenon. Rem right? Remote viewing is, and this has been proven scientifically, proved it at Duke University. Right. There were some people who were able, they had a study at Duke, uh, with people who could do remote viewing and they were able to tell what was happening in another room mm -hmm. by astral projecting right well saying. sort of sending their i mean i teach remote viewing but i learned it from a guy who taught it to the cia the cia sponsored they have viewers they have viewers for 20 years they sponsored the stanford research institute right. on how to project their consciousness to other locales meaning that who we are is not local to your body we think the brain generates awareness. But what if the awareness was before the brain? So let's say it's like a computer. You have the hardware, that's the brain. You have the software, which is like your personality. But what makes that work? It's the person, it's consciousness. The consciousness makes the hardware and software work. Without a, someone at the keyboard, you just sit there. So does that make sense to you? You're a very interesting man. No, but no you are a very, 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 very yeah, interesting guy. But, I mean yeah, that. I, I know. Thank you. But doesn't that make sense? Sure. If you didn't have consciousness, Bill, you just sit there like a, a, a mean and potatoes there. Well, that happens to me sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, do we have uh, Dino at the library? Do we have any questions? It would be great. To, and we may have some questions here. We, we might have some questions, but I just want to read Go another ahead. little part here that because well, the book is called Preparing for the new realities of extraterrestrial yes. existence. First of all, another reason the government isn't coming forward is that they don't know how to explain this. There seems to be well, another- they should hire you because you seem to know I, how to I don't, explain it. I think it works on quantum physics theory that, you know, of non-locality that these things can be in superposition, you know, about quantum physics. So they're not using Newtonian science. You're asking me if I know about quantum physics? I am asking you. Uh, no, <laughs> no, that's why you're my new friend. <laughs> okay. Because with you, I can understand these well, things. I'm gonna teach you remote viewing too, okay? okay? So the reason, one of the reasons, besides all the others we yeah. mentioned, is that the government really doesn't know how to explain this phenomenon. There's something out there, they don't know what it is. This is why people in this movement and it's called the Making Contact Movement. And there's a big seminar happening this week. Look up makingcontact.com. They wanna make this a people's movement. We need to like march on Washington. We need to demand Senate hearings so they That's can- That's true, that'd be good. We need to get them to pull out the hardware, the bodies, everything they've been covering up since Roswell, since 1947, and have an open discussion about this. Yeah. You know, put it out well, on the table. Look, the government, it seems to be yeah. moving closer to doing something like that. They are, yeah, but right. very slowly. But one, another question yeah. that, that came out, actually a question that, that you gave to me, is yeah. that, why do scientists, scientists have such a difficult time accepting this? Well, you know, you look at someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, brilliant scientist, they show him the video from the Nimitz, he goes, well, that's probably an artifact on the radar. Scientists are very attached to their ideas about what the world is. And provable. And provable, but they're attached to their belief system. It's some, you know, there's a book by Thomas Kuhn, who wrote Theories in Scientific Revolution. He says, Science evolves one funeral at a time, actually. Whoa. That's because scientists says, this is how the world is, and there's nothing that's gonna change my idea. So science, they believe in their belief system. They go beyond the fact that about provability. You know, Bud Hopkins says the job of science is to investigate the unexplained, right. not to explain and the uninvestigated. And then prove it. But scientists we know explain yeah. the uninvestigated. So you get people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, hate to single him out, but he's really no, ridiculed good. the UFO movement saying there's nothing to it. Why don't people with cell phones come along and have pictures? Because this is not just happening in this reality. Like Jane said, it's like, it's if this happens in a slightly altered state. So go ahead. Well, what you know, I have an idea here, yeah. and I hope someone's listening from the East Hampton Library or yeah. somebody could theoretically underwrite this. 
I think a debate mm -hmm. between you okay. and Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'd love that. Would be if I wouldn't you go? Yes. And not just me, but I'm going to bring out some of the experts who I uh, have. Just you two okay. on stage debating I, that. I'd be on the front row. Or I, maybe I could moderate it. No, but, but I would enough like to bring people like Linda Moulton Howe, who's been investigating cattle mutilations. What? You know, there's this whole thing out in Colorado. Mexico. In New Mexico, there have been cows that have been drained of blood that have been seen in the vicinity of UFOs. And they think they're using some of that cow, D cow DNA for what I was talking about, the hybrid program. That's one theory. So there's so much to this. There's so many moving parts. We just like skim the surface here, but uh, I can talk about John Mack. You yeah, know? do that. John, John Mack. Mack didn't believe any of this. He thought everyone was crazy until he started talking to people who had experiences. He happened to be a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. He was a clinical psychiatrist. And he said, these people aren't crazy. They're having a real experience. So he's one of the key figures, even though he died like 20 years ago, I put an essay that was never <clears throat> published before on this book right. because he validates people's experience. He says, no, there's something real to this. And we have to validate the Anything you tell me that might that you experience, how can I doubt your experience? How can I doubt your passion and the intensity of what you're saying is real to you? Well, but right now, honestly, there I would have to say, right now we're living in a culture where people are saying all manner of things that aren't I, true. I know, but and we, they have to be doubted. We can't but, just because somebody. But what says about something. experience? So what, a lot I of people not, say I will not question experience. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Mac interviewed people who had experience, not. People who make things up because they heard it on the internet right. and there was no internet then. So there's a lot of people who would validate, like Grant Cameron has made, he's, a, he's written an essay in this book. He says, every UF, US president had some sort of interaction with a UFO, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan. Yeah, Carter, I know, they, right. Reagan did. And then they go once they're elected and then they're shut out by the military, like, and they say, no, on, you know, on really you know, need to know basis. So right now something's cracking with inside government. The people are coming forward and saying, yes, there's something real to this. You're getting it's, a phone call uh, from somebody from, my, <laughs> from outer space. Oh, that's, yeah. I've never seen that area code. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, something- All righty, something, there go. There he Something is. is cracking with inside government that wants this information out there. And Bill, you are great. You, you, <laughs> this guy's great. You are part of the disclosure. It's called disclosure. Yeah. Let's see if there's any other questions. Oh, we have, we have a question. Question yeah. from. We have a question. Uh, let's yeah, you see. can read this. A good theory uh, is one that is... asks. A good theory is okay. one. We can read it. You, you read it. Go ahead. A good theory is one that is falsifiable, like law, Newton's laws, like Einstein's like, theories. How are you pay, UAP's missions fall, falsifiable? Falsifiable. What does that mean? You think? Well, I think it means it can deprove the law. I don't, honestly, I can't answer that. Well, Excuse me? How do we make it false? How do we make it, how do we make well, it false? Well, there's objects that are defying the laws of gravity that are moving in and out of our atmosphere, and they are true to people. These are realities that are showing up on screen, and they, they're they proven to be true. There's like, um, let's call it, um, well, when I talked about quantum physics, there's something called superposition in quantum physics. There's wave particle these objects seem to possess a quantum approach to the way they're moving they're not using newton's second law of thermodynamics which means a power on one side pushes you this way we're still using that it was right. developed in the 1700s and we're still using our jets and cars to 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 right. move along those laws but there's something else happening that these uips are using that are not propelled we have way. any more questions otherwise let's i see. think we're going to wrap it up but we're going to wrap right. it up in, in, with a couple of important things okay good let me see Here's i mean this. i hope i just made people think that there is a reality the government is coming forward and saying this is real and they're saying we don't know what it is so why don't we all just investigate it instead of being afraid of what's out there let's go with an adventure into the unknown something is out there we don't know what it is let's investigate absolutely. that is all i'm saying here absolutely and 
Uh, no, yeah. I, I look yeah. at the beginning of the show. I said I want you. We wanted the book mm -hmm. making contact is essentially trying to convince us that the extraordinary is acceptable, is yeah. understandable. You've done a, a brilliant job of the book. <laughs> The book is not just written by Alan. Yeah. The book is essentially essays of, of the leaders in the field. I don't know if we can actually want to try something. We're in Babette's restaurant right now. Mm -hmm. And really, it's a, a lovely place. It is. And we hope that you'll come back and, and, and visit Babette's. It's very nice to keep the place open for yes, us here. Yes, yes. And I'm very happy. And actually, we had dinner. You know, she, I know. It was very meal. nice to have meal. dinner. Yes. And it was a good meal, too. Oh, very yes. good. No, but Bill, I are you convinced? When you say the extraordinary, like what the, yeah. the woman who Look. came up and told her experience, that's an extraordinary experience. Imagine if everyone was open and having these kinds of experiences, because they are coming in increasing numbers. And sightings are up worldwide, not just in the US. I talked to a UFOologist in China, in Italy, in France, in Australia. This is happening, and we need to wake up to the fact that, that, that we're good. not alone. Uh, Alan, we, why don't we let's wrap it up by telling people where because we're right on time to wrap 45 minutes yes where they can see you your youtube channel right it's important that they can subscribe you've got right. hundreds of thousands of subscribers i'm Go talking ahead. about this every day on my youtube channel that's youtube.com slash new realities new realities is also the name of the show i do on manhattan cable it's sort of been the kind of um moniker i've used to explore these realms but every day on youtube practically i'm interviewing someone who's either seen a sighting or a government insider or people just talking about these yeah. extraordinary realities and it's there is a spiritual component to this and what is a youtube channel again youtube.com slash new realities new realities new reality. and you can also buy this book on amazon on barnes and noble you can get it at your barnes and noble store we're and making contact look we're making contact <laughs> i didn't know you were that funny bill you should i know but i know i just want to say one more thing when you funny? listen this is my book it's a funny book <laughs> Right, let's see your book. No, no. Let, let's show your book because I want to do a little promo I'm, for you. I'm going to sign that book for you, by the Spike, way. Spike, the Wonder Dog. That's right. This is making contact, Bill. I want to make contact with Spike. <laughs> well, Spike, <laughs> made, honestly, the dog narrated the story to me. My book, I was signing last night, near you, as a matter of right. fact. Right. The Adventures of Spike, the Wonder Dog, actually, was it's an, inter it's an interesting mental thing. Mm -hmm. I had a dog, the dog got killed a long time ago and the dog was a big star on my show in north carolina I and i thought that. what if the dog had come to new york when i came to new york to the show mm -hmm. and became a big star in on new york television mm -hmm. here's the only thing i want to report i sat down to write and instantly a voice of the dog that i had never written in that i had never done any comedy in or anything came through me meaning the the, the every writer who's writing fiction wants to have the voice of the central character right so magical things can happen if you keep your mind open to letting them happen well that's what we're here to do we're that. here to have some new realities yeah. we had to have a spiritual awakening you know this is about the spirit coming forward and, no, and saying there's more to the human being than i've been told there's more to who we are there's more to reality i think it's much vaster than we've been educated to believe, our politics, our government, our religions. We've been dumbed down. And the idea about this book is to open us up to something greater than we've been told. And that's what making contact, it's making contact with ourselves, each other, and the universe. This this is a this will be available on your YouTube channel. I mean yes. the show. Yes. It's, it's it's honestly something you can watch and listen to twice. You're wonderful, Alan. And read the book because I make a lot of points we aren't able to come <laughs> to cover here. But there's some there's a guy who's had an experience with a ET for 38 years, Daryl Anka. He writes about his story. It's in the book. It's right Alan, here. Alan, thank you, man. Bill, you uh, you're are- No, no, you. No, no you. You're terrific. <laughs> you are the professional. Are. I would like to have the reputation you have. I I'm not so good. sure you want my reputation. <laughs> All right, say goodbye, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank bye, you. Dino. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, bye, bye, bye. Thank you. Goodbye, thank everybody. East Hampton Library. Excellent. Thank you all for watching. And get the book, Start Making Contact. Well done. Okay. Thanks, folks. <laughs>